Hello, today we're going to talk about the Smart Level Boiler Water Level Indication System. The Smart Level Indication System consists of a conductivity probe column, which is a pipe manifold with a series of probes in it, which is wired to a control unit, and a panel indicator that's usually mounted in a remote location, typically the control room. Before we begin, just a moment on the column. The column's a large chamber with a series of sensors in it that we call conductivity probes. They're located in relation to the connection center piping coming off the boiler with a set of isolation valves, and there would normally be a drain valve coming off the bottom. The probes are located based on specific locations that are customer specified. In addition, to the different probes, we have actually a total of seven different probes to choose from depending upon the design pressure of your boiler and the application concerns. The probes have different pressure ratings of 450, 1,000, 1,800, and 3,000 PSI, or we might say 200 bar for those of you on the international side in our crowd today. When it comes to the control unit, the smart level is available in multiple enclosures. The standard enclosure is a weatherproof steel NEMA 4 enclosure uh, rated to IP66. We also have this enclosure available in stainless steel rated to IP66. It's also available in a classified area enclosure with barriers to protect the circuitry going to the different components. On the door of the unit, you'll see we have the name Smart Level. This larger indicator is the one that's most commonly specified for the control room. We have it mounted on this demo unit. But ordinarily, if an indicator is required on the door of the control, it'll be the small model, which you see behind a glass window and this weather-sealed picture frame type arrangement around it. Inside the control unit, a couple of important things. Our factory nameplate with the serial data and order reference data information is on the inside so that it will always survive time with elements in plants or outdoor environments. On the control side itself, there's a host motherboard and all the components are modular. The terminal blocks all unplug for easy field wiring. The power is brought in to the lower right. There's a series of test switches about halfway up on the right-hand side. There's a series of modules. These modules, each one contains its own microprocessor to detect what that particular probe is doing in the column. In this case, we've got 10 modules plugged in. The standard model is capable of 10, 12 probes. Um, we can do an expansion board in a slightly larger enclosure and design systems for up to 24 probes. But generally speaking, 10 and 12 are what most customers specify. These modules have some adjustable features. There are little dip switches on them, and they're adjustable, but the switches are all recessed on these different modules so that it avoids tinkering or tampering. Um, there's a series of switches for adjusting a three-second time delay, adjusting high or low water sensitivity, some other features for future use, and more features that you can read about different testing functions in our, that are detailed in our instruction manual. If we look further to the left, you'll see uh, three separate boards. There is a 4 to 20 milliamp board, an indicator output board, and a relay card. The 4 to 20 milliamp board is designed so that it responds to each probe with uh, 3.85 milliamps when there's no water in the column, 4 milliamps when the lowest probe sees water, and up to 20 milliamps when the highest probe sees water. So for example, in that 16 milliamp range, if you had 10 probes in your system, each probe that responds to coming into contact with water would add approximately 1.6 milliamps of contribution to that output if all the probes were equally spaced. If you choose to space the probes in unequal increments based on your design considerations, 
then the amount of contribution each probe makes can be adjusted independently and quite easily. Uh, the minimum spacing from probe center to center is one inch or 25 millimeters, and there's no maximum in between. We've made columns that are 18 inches connection centers on up to columns that were multiple feet in length to suit your boiler application. The next card is the indicator output card. You'll see a plug here in the bottom and the wiring going to these door mounted indicators. The larger indicator has been wired for this demo purpose only. The smaller indicator that you see here, that would be the typical door mounted indicator, has been wired with that cable. A remote indicator would plug in with a terminal block in the center of this board. Then the board you see on the left is a relay card. The relay card is designed with six independent switches. Each card has a power status light on it, letting you know that it's getting power, and a green indication light, letting you know that the card is operating properly. We'll talk about those again in a moment. When these cards and systems leave the factory, we have set one switch to each of the top three probes and a switch to each of the bottom three probes. Those are the most likely candidates for low trip being the lowest probe, high trip being the highest probe, and high alarm, the second or third from the top, low alarm, the second or third from the bottom. If a user decides that they want something different, the card is removed, turned sideways, and you expose a whole series of dip switches, which by following our instruction manual can be reset to activate any switch to any particular probe that you desire. As an extreme, you could set all six switches to probe number one if you wished. So with that, the other comment on accessory boards is we recommend that you do not remove any accessory boards for adjustments while the unit is in operation. If you wish to remove a board, power down the unit and then do as you need to do. If we look at the indicators on the door, you'll see we have green indications for water, red indications for steam. We have a white normal indication status light. So as the level were to fall or rise from normal, an operator can easily have a reference to that normal indicating level. Should they step away from their chair and be looking from across the room, you can see if a deviation is starting to happen and quickly get back in control of that water level and get it back to where it should be, up or down. There's a green status light on the lower left of the indicator. That is alerting you that all systems are communicating with one another correctly. If that green light were to turn red, it's an indication that there is a communication signal issue with one of the components. The corrective action there would be to open the door to the control, look inside any component that has the red status indication on it would be the one that is suspect. The light in the lower left, excuse me, the light in the lower right is the blowdown indication light. If this light illuminates blue, it's a warning light to the operator alerting them that the system needs a blowdown that one or more of the sensors have become contaminated. Uh, that blue light will activate if the contamination builds up significantly for a steady period of 18 hours. Once that 18 hour point has been timed out, then that blue light will activate. In the event that the blue light comes on, you conduct a blowdown. If the blowdown is successful in cleaning the probes, probe or probes, the blue light will go out. If the blue light stays on, then a technician opens up the door to the control, looks for the module, which would have the blue light on it as well. That would indicate to you which probe needs to be serviced. The modules where they plug into the host motherboard are numbered on the sides of where they plug in and they're numbered from bottom to top. So channel four, for example, would be the fourth probe from the bottom. Other things I'd like to point out uh, is wiring and indication. On the indication systems, we do run into, on occasion, colorblind personnel in the plants. 
with the flip of a switch, I can simply deactivate the red lights that were indicating steam. So we have green lights on, or you might simply say lights on for water, no lights on for steam. This way, if a colorblind individual is still in the area trying to read this indicator, it can be set up to accommodate them. And it's simply returned back to normal again by flipping that switch. There's other modes for testing that can be conducted. We can test the blue light. We can test all the indications in sequence, in flashing. There's a lot of detail in our instruction manual that you can download from our website. I'd like to point out one more thing about wiring. The wiring from the control unit to the probes in the column is normally done with coax wire. And that's a coax RG174 type wire, much smaller than that coax wire you're accustomed to in your homes. Uh, this wire is routed from the control unit to a junction box right near the column. From the junction box near the column, high temperature insulated wire is routed directly to the probes. The reason we mandate the coax wire is when the control unit is located more than 15 conduit feet from the column, we want to be sure that no signal noise from anything else going on in the plant would trigger that blue blowdown light needlessly. We are monitoring those probes uh, very carefully and we don't want any false signals. Um, however, if your control unit is within 15 conduit feet from the probe column, we have a signal filter we can install quite easily that plugs into the output terminal block and you can run the high temp wire from the probes directly to the control unit and eliminate the need for the coax cable. The distance from the control unit to the remote indicator is rated at one mile or 1.6 kilometers. The wiring from the control unit to the remote indicator is a four conductor shielded cable. And you're actually using only three of those conductors and attaching the shield at the control unit and dead ending it at the indicator location. Uh, as far as incoming power, it's important to make sure that it's properly installed and that the system is properly grounded. In the lower left of the host motherboard, you'll see a large rectangular plugged in item that's the main power supply that drives the entire system. For those that are concerned about power supply reliability, we have designed this power supply that we are only using a small fraction of its capacity to operate the system and the indicator circuitry. However, there is a place for a second power supply if you're concerned about having that redundancy. When two power supplies are installed, they actually share the load, communicate with each other, and in the event one power supply were to fail, the other would take over and operate the system completely. And that red light would be indicated on the status indication in the lower left-hand corner of the control indicator. So in conclusion, the system is very simple. It's very easy to diagnose. It just takes a little bit of information to be knowledgeable on how the system works. However, we have a lot of information on our website at clarkreliance.com. If you go into Reliance Boiler Trim product line, we have a video library there. We have a whole detailed list of instruction manuals. There's a 40 some odd page instruction manual that covers all the details on this system as well as you can contact one of our Reliance application engineers on our team for detailed technical advice from our staff if needed. And we want to thank you for your time and attention today. You have a wonderful day.